So I, I have been mostly the uh, chairman and CEO of the French Saint-Gobain Company, which uh, was founded uh, 350 years ago. And in business is mostly about uh, everything which is related to building materials, uh, both uh, and some technological materials, uh, but both as a producer and also as a distributor. Uh, my own background is I'm um, a graduate from um, the Ecole Polytechnique and graduate from uh, a few other schools. Uh, I started uh, <coughs> working for the French government uh, in the, the division of oil, which at that time was interesting because there was a very big, uh, I mean, government program about oil, which finally brought the health group and then the total group. And uh, I, I left the government and went to the private sector, to Saint-Gobain. Frankly, m I didn't know what they were doing, but their chairman had a very high reputation. So I, I went to that company mostly because of the reputation of the chairman. Uh, I, uh, I started at uh, Vice President Corporate Planning in 1974. I'm born in 1941. And uh, I became uh, then uh, head of one of the uh, first uh, chief operating officer of one of the biggest division, about 15% of the group. Uh, then I became, uh, by, by the way, the group today is a 42 billion euro company. So it's one of the large company of France, 42 billion. <laughs> and we employ about 190,000 people in about 64 countries. And uh, by saying we are there, I mean with plants, not only selling those countries. We have plants in 64 countries. So it's, it's a large company of France. We have long been there. We are one of the largest companies to be in the equivalent of the CAC 40, the top 15 companies always for a very, very, very long time. Um, of course, I had to change a lot Saint-Gobain. And to, uh, I'm going to explain to you the basics of what I understand about the change of the economic world and how I think uh, there are challenges for a company to adapt to, to, to that changing world. Because, uh, as I said, uh, I, in fact, I became a chief operating officer in 1982. I was quite young, I was 41. I became chief uh, executive officer in 1986, and I stayed chief executive officer for 21 years until 107. So that's a very long time. I was the youngest and I really started with the, the oldest. And uh, after I stayed three years as, uh, as um, non-executive chairman, and today I'm in advisory positions. Uh, well, I have board membership like JDF Suez, but my main advisory is I am uh, I'm senior advisor to Lazar Group which is an important com company in, in the field of uh, uh, merger and acquisitions and assets management. So that's what I'm doing presently. So I, I'm going to present, uh, to present my views to you on this question of mainly economics in the global world, which I understand is your master. I hope I read it well. and. Uh, and I'm going to straight to three points. First point will be, what was the world about 25 years ago where some big changes which has happened have not yet happened? Mostly, of course, the opening of the communist world to the market economy, which certainly has been one of the major changing events of the world planet. Number two is, uh, well, now, what is the present attitude, especially of the states, uh, in front of this changing globalization of the economy? I'll start with the states, because I think the states today are playing the major role in front of the companies. That we'll discuss. And thirdly, of course, is uh, how companies are conducting themselves within that framework, and also what are the changes in terms of power 
mainly states, but that influence, of course, the situation of the companies uh, uh, presently. So that's about the views uh, plan in which I'm going to present my views. Well, I must say that I personally started in a kind of world where um, things were rather simple. Uh, they, were, they were totally directed by the views we got from the United States and the United Kingdom. It was a kind of uh, global view, and there was the best way. There were a best way for companies, and there were a best way for, uh, for states. Somewhat the ideas which were at that time quite widely accepted are still the ideas mainly accepted in USA and UK, but they are less and less accepted by the rest of the planet. Uh, basically, of course, uh, there, there, there was a view which is that uh, the best way to run company and uh, to have the states making the framework for companies is free market economy. That is really today nearly accepted everywhere. And that's, of course, a big change because uh, the centralist planification of a communist economy is finished nearly in every country. So big change, and on that stage, unification of the planet and somewhat the winning of the views of the Western world. Uh, companies are there in a free market economy where you exchange things, and their aim is to make the best profit. This is about the rule. Uh, of course, there are different, and we can come in some places where this rule is not totally applied, but mainly this is uh, the whole thing which is uh, quite uh, accepted. This is an important point. The fact that second rule, which is also part of what is said as a good thing to be done in the United States and the United Kingdom, is that there is a primacy of shareholders. Shareholders' views must run the company. The governments of the company and the CEO must be at the order of the shareholders. I'm going to state that this view is now much more disputed presently. And there has been a long time, uh, I mean, there has been a book famous by Mr. in French, by Mr. Michel Albert, uh, between the fact that you have this view, which I would call financial liberalism, and another view, which is more called, like, uh, I call it personally, industrial and commercial view, but it's what is called also the stakeholder view, that the, a company is not a network of contracts, but a company is really uh, an institution. With, uh, an, an institution has duties in front of their employees, they have duties in front of their country, and things like that. And they have duties to continue uh, what has been done by their predecessors. This is what we could call the stakeholder view. At that time, mainly the stakeholder view was for the company who applied them, kept very quiet. Even at that time, two countries were really applying a stakeholder view. One was Germany and one was Japan. Germany and Japan at that time were already in the stakeholder view. About the states, uh, the view what, what is related to, uh, has been called quite often, the Washington Consensus, is that uh, a state to make the best economic policy for being a prosperous state is to be uh, fully open open to capital, open to uh, the possibility to letting buy companies, open to uh, making companies free investments, and everything. The most open view. That, of course, has brought uh, a certain number of problems, but that was the view which was uh, the fact. So, 
financial liberalism for companies and for states also Washington consensus and a free market attitude of the states. I, I basically personally think that uh, free market uh, is good for exchange of goods, exchange of services, but I don't think free market has to be respected for the exchange of one, one special good, which is the capital of companies. The capital of companies, in my view, should not be treated on a free market attitude because it brings power. Free market, uh, the, the, the capital of a company, the role of the shareholders brings the governance of the company, so the power of the company, and by the way, also what a company could bring to his own country. So power, powers are at stake when you speak about the capital and so it should not be treated the same way you treat goods and services. Now, what has been the bigger changes? As I say, the big changes has been the opening of uh, the communist co country to market economy. And about the communist country, you can somewhat split them in the roughly three groups. One group is Eastern Europe, but not all Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, where historically uh, it was in uh, uh, the Rome influence, uh, where were the Protestant and the Catholics. That part of Eastern Europe adapted very quickly to Western Europe. And basically companies in that part of Europe mainly has been taken over, the most important ones, has been taken over by Western companies, especially Europeans, and especially Germans. So there is, a, there is a story of what has happened quite successfully in Poland, in Czech Republic, and of lesser importance in Hungary, uh, Slovakia, and you can add the others. But mainly, they, con they, they really adapted quite similar policy by the states as Western states of Western Europe. Of course, I'm not speaking about uh, Eastern Germany, which was at high cost integrated in Western Germany. But for the rest, I personally think that when you go to where you have the orthodox thinking, uh, which means Bulgaria, Romania, of course, Russia. Today, economies are not yet successful. They have not adapted the same things. Mainly, why are not that successful? Because you always have to refer to history. In the eastern part, in the western part, of so-called Eastern Europe, there has always been a kind of middle class. <coughs> There were the king, there were the servants doing, uh, of course, uh, for peasant. But in between, there were companies which were bringing a way of trading habits and capitalism. The, if you read uh, the great historian Brodel, you'll, you'll understand that because that's the way capitalism started in Europe in, uh, in the Renaissance time. If you go to uh, the eastern part, let's say Romania, Bulgaria, and especially Russia, there is nothing between the Tsar and the bottom of the society. There is no intermediate. Where are the entrepreneurs of Russia? They are not. The, the Russian businessmen are only the, the men who are near uh, the uh, president of Russia. So there is a very big lack of entrepreneurship which is in that part of Eastern Europe and which is not in the part of the Western part of uh, Europe. So I think it is a big mistake of Europe 
to have integrated, I personally, I'm going to give absolutely personal views, but I think it has been a big, very big mistake of Europe to integrate within Europe companies or countries, I mean, like Bulgaria, Romania, which are not really prepared to have the same kind of uh, attitudes for economy. By the way, I'm not sure we should have even integrated Greece at the starting point. Uh, because uh, Greece, as you know, is, is part of that, the, that area. Greece, historically, is not part. Uh, they have the Orthodox uh, uh, Church. They, they don't have the Protestant and Catholic. So uh, I am, uh, 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 what is happening to Greece, if you read history, is not a surprise. We should never have integrated uh, uh, Euro, Greece, at least in the Euro. Well, the third part, of course, is what is happening, and the most important part has been what is happening uh, in Asia. And of course, in Asia, uh, I'm referring uh, to China. The integration of China in a <coughs> free market economy, or more exactly what is called uh, Chinese socialism. There, there is an extremely interesting book which is just published uh, about uh, the new president of China, Xi Jinping. I'm going to have a debate with Mr. Vedrin uh, on, on that book because I've, I've, I've been to China about each year for 32 years. Same thing for Japan, same thing for South Korea and significantly also in India. Uh, from the very start I was impressed uh, by the capacity of Asia to raise and build. Of course, extremely differently, uh, but especially impressed by China. So, China, China, China is really a big change of that. But there was also the interesting evolution of South Korea, and there were the long-time attitudes of Japan. What some companies were doing, they were ex ex exactly doing everything the American thinks a state should not be doing. They were interfering in the economy, while the attitude usually in UK and US <coughs> is uh, have less, as if the state is the smallest influence, it is the best to make the economy work. On the other end, in those countries, the uh, attitude of interference of the state was major. Of course, it was not major by the state doing things directly. Mostly, of course, they were state-owned companies. But somewhat in many of these areas, the major, and especially, for example, in Japan and South Korea, the attitude mainly is the state must set the framework for companies to work well, but not act directly. It's exactly my view I have on France, for example. For a long time, France, I thought that uh, direct action by the state was a good thing. And frankly, it has been a good thing at the time of General de Gaulle and President Pompidou to build up some technologies and companies in France which are still important companies like Airbus and others, or, or the space companies also. But now I, I think this, for France also, this time is bygone. Uh, the best thing the states can make is a German attitude. Make a framework and let an internal consensus being built, if possible. So, mainly, first, yes, state, but a state which sets a framework. This is common to those countries. I, s I have just stated them, and I state them again, Germany, China, South Korea, and Japan. Secondly, those countries, when they have to make a choice, they always arbitrate against the consumer and for the enterprise and the companies. Typical. This is the opposite of France.
friends, when there is a problem, they, are they arbitrate for the consumer and not for the company. For example, uh, if you take the electricity price compared to Germany between France, the French citizen pays its electricity half the price of the German citizen. But for the big companies, and of course we have the cost of electricity which is the lower because of our nuclear program. But if you take the big companies, well for the big companies using a lot of electricity, the Germans pays about the price even slightly lower than the French price. Because always when there is a choice, uh, Germany arbitrate against its consumer, always for its companies. Supported by the big strength of Germany, which are the head of companies, plus the unions. Because the unions in Germany are high supporters of that policy. Number two, when Germany has to choose between services and industry, Germany always choose industry, contrary to France, always. Uh, industry, uh, and, and that is exactly also the same in the other countries. Those companies think industry is very important. Japan thinks it's very important, South Korea thinks it's very important, and, uh, and uh, China thinks it's very important. United States don't think it's so important. United States thinks uh, the most important thing is services. And of course, the services for the United States, the real leaders are the services of the new network economy. The real leaders, the Americans love and support at the utmost, are the Facebook, the Google, and the Apple. And they are right. And they did it. With a lot of government money, by the way, through their military system, DARPA. So it's not, uh, it's not by a miracle of just a nice startup. It's a lot of government money from the military. Now, the United Kingdom is another story. Everything has no importance except the city. Uh, the, the, the British are made to serve the rich of the planet. This, this is their natural vocation. It is totally different, and they do it very well. And it, it's totally, totally different from what wants continental Europe. This means why in Europe, if we want to have a common policy, continental Europe has to do nothing with the British. Maybe the British want to leave Europe, but I believe Europe would be very better off without the British in terms of economy. I'm not saying we should not, of course, keep a lot of links, but for economy like uh, like uh, convergence uh, in social uh, rules, convergence in uh, fiscal policy, convergence in regulation of the financial industry, <coughs> I think we'll be always in stronger position with, with the British. The British policy is very clear, one the city, two the city, three the city, uh, and that's all. If companies are bought by foreign companies, they don't care. If they have low salaries uh, for the services, they don't care. My only surprise is there is no rebellion in Great Britain. But uh, I think it's because the order is, is well organized and uh, accepted. At least the uh, one who are really not part of the city. OK, but that's the way, that's the way uh, uh, I make a kind of thing. So those countries, as I said, are pro-companies, pro pro-industry, mercantilist. Mercantilist, it means that they are happy when they sell to the outside world more than they buy. Because it's a part of an independence view of the country to be mercantilist. And how you become mercantilist? If you look at statistics, you never become 
with a positive, systematic accident of your trade through services. You always come out of it through industry and energy. So, if you are a mercantilist, automatically you are an industrialist. And that is a very, it's a very, in my view, it's a very important point. Now, so if I want to summarize this new world and new game which is happening, it's no longer a competition between companies with a kind of common level field, same rules all over the planet, which was the basic ideas we had before. Before the ideas we had was get the same rules, get the same competition rules, get the same opening rules, let the same uh, ownership rules for all companies in the planet. The states must accept that common rules, valid for all the world, must apply to the way companies have their governance. That was the basic things. Today, not at all. It's a battle between states through national champions. And that is, that is of course, a major change. For example, European competition policy, which really is totally based on the old rules, make competition the most open of well, is, is one of the worst things for French, for French and European enterprise. Because they are preventing European champions and letting the companies in Europe being too small, and then they can be much more easily uh, losing their markets to foreign competitions, where you can receive, uh, of course, uh, where concentration is, is extremely adapted. Let me give you an example. If we take the telecommunication industry, you have about uh, three major companies in the United States. And in Europe, you have 26 companies. And even when two of them merge in poor France, they, they, they commission on, uh, on, uh, the, on competition in France nearly uh, find it's uh, dramatic for the consumer. So we'll, we'll have finally a consumer extremely well protected, but only foreign producers and not national European producers. So the link in Europe uh, Industrial policy has been one of the weaknesses in Europe. There has been no common view on industrial policy between the European states. And as I am going to tell you anyway, at 27, they'll never have, will never have a common uh, industrial or even economic policy. Uh, Two-speed Europe is needed as soon as possible if we try to take some place in a world where every European state is reducing his influence in power, even the Germans, at, Euro at the world level. Now, let me a little explain what I, I've said that we are now in a world where what is important first is the relation between the states. So it, it could be interesting to start wondering what are now today the relations between, on an economic point of view, between the different economic blocks of the planet? What are the relations? Before somewhat uh, there was what I would call a Wilson, on Wilson view. Wilson, you know, where, where there was an American theory that Everything which was, I mean, said by the United States, Wilson, uh, internationally, was the right way to govern the planet. We are now moving from Wilson, where we, we have been until recently, that was the truth, until somewhat the American, the 
get stuck first in Vietnam, then a bit uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we, we were in a Wilson Union world, especially after the Americans somewhat won uh, the Cold War with the Russians. But now it's changing. And the world, if we come back to history, and you have seen that uh, I personally love to introduce historical views in what I think and uh, I've always run my company with a historic book in my hand. Uh, I think we have to remember two moments of history, which in my view are very interesting to understand the present relation between the economic blocks. Maybe you are not specialist of those, uh, those points, so I'm going uh, uh, to give you a very, very summary of that. One is the Westphalia peace, la paix de Westphalie. What is the Westphalia peace? After a big war of 30 years between the German states, between in fact the Catholic and the Protestant, then came a peace which was called the Westphalia peace, la paix de Westphalie. And what says the rule, what was the rule of the Westphalia peace is that there will be Catholic state in Germany and there will be Protestant state and each of them is going to accept that there are values in the other state and we are not going to make the war because of trying to have common values. This is exactly what's happening today. I don't think we are going in a world where there will be wars now, so much, for common values. Or to say it differently, Western world, based by the Americans and ourselves, will have our historical value, which is traditionally called Christian and uh, les Lumières, uh, the, va the values of uh, Voltaire and uh, 18th century values, or you can draw that, of course, to the, to the British philosopher, individualism, Humes and everything. So there are Western values, okay. But those values are not going to be the Asian values. Asian values are going to be Confucius values, still Confucius. When, when you run both the state or a company, in my view, in China. The view is you obey to the boss and the boss must take care, take, care, take care of you. And this is, in my view, typically what are still the values presently, I mean ruling the government attitudes and the company attitudes in countries like Japan, South Korea and China. Uh, I recently read, uh, as I told you, this very interesting book which is right these days in our libraries, which is the, uh, called in, in, in French, it is in French, The Governance of China, which is our speeches by uh, Xi Jinping, President of China. And they are extremely interesting about that. One of the basic view of the economy and political view of China is no interference into what each country thinks. Muslim countries could have Muslim values, Chinese countries which uh, will have Chinese values, European, American, Western countries will have their values, but the time where the Western should think that their values are eternal and our values all over the planet, in my view, is dead. We are now in a world of the West, uh, Westphalia peace. We are going to be forced to recognize that each country has its values, its way of governance, and there is not one best way. The way a government, a country must be run, the way even a company must be managed today is based on the national values of the country where 
you are doing your business. That is my view. And you know, it's, it's very different because then it's, it's no way to go to course where you are telling uh, the best way to run a company. Uh, if you want to run a company in China, instead of taking courses at Advard Business School, you better read a historical book about China. Uh, you'll be much, much prepared to make uh, li less mistakes in running companies in China if you read history than in you if you read management. So uh, that has been my own experience, at least. Whether it's India, it's the same, of course. Brazil also is the same, although Brazil is typically, Brazil uh, was made, in fact, by, uh, I mean, people coming from Spain, from uh, Italy, from Portugal, Brazil from Portugal, and of course they have uh, Western values, which is not the case of other places. Okay, so first point, Western, Westphalia peace. Second point. Vienna Treaty. Vienna Treaty was made in, uh, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars to set uh, an equilibrium in Europe between the states after Napoleon. It was made by the great uh, minister of Austria, Metternich. And of course, it was accepted. And it lasted quite a long time. It lasted nearly. Uh, well, until the war between Bavaria and, uh, and Prussia, about that thing, that it blew up somewhat. But the interesting thing of the Vienna Treaty, which I think is also quite valid for the present world, is you fight, but you don't make war between yourself. I mean, the, of course, China and America are fighting. For example, in the sea near uh, sea, uh, where there are all those islands, but they are not going to make the war for that. They are no longer making t making the war for Taiwan. It's over. They'll they'll make the compromise of one China, but uh, <coughs> Taiwan will still have its own uh, kind of independence in one way, but still under. China unity somewhat. So, so the world is going uh, to uh, fight, to uh, advances, to take over, to do things, but they are not going to be the brutal wars we had uh, during First World War and Second World War. So it will be a, a world where uh, people are going to gain influence mainly through economy and much less through other things. Political influence with the use of weapons will somewhat be reduced. Uh, that could appear for what I'm saying completely stupid when you see what's happening in the Middle East. But even in the Middle East, uh, the present, what's happening, for example, in Syria and everything, it's, it's, it's quite different when, than what happened when the United States invaded Vietnam. It's very different. It's war, but restricted somewhat. Restricted. New weapons, very, very uh, modern, preserving much more the life of the soldiers. Uh, Remember, we are, we are shocked by, uh, uh, and even the President of the Republic nearly make a speech for each soldier death. Uh, if, if he would have been uh, in World War I, he would have made millions of speeches. Now, it's, it's different. We, we are on that aspect in a, in a kind of, of, of different, uh, different world. That means that what is going to be important is going to be economy and technology. The, the new battleground will be technology. Technology, it's clear that there is a leadership in the United States. It's also clear that there is growing, and in my view, more and more successful efforts in the Asian countries. In many fields, still Japan 
is the real industrial leader. I'm not saying in what is apparent in the United States, uh, but and I'm not speaking about the university system. I personally believe for innovation and preparing innovative companies and things like that, the United States are still, in my view, the best. But the others are making great, great efforts. Uh, the number of patents, the number of new ideas, the, the willingness to have startups, a uh, big program nationally financed, uh, uh, are extremely impressive in China. In many companies, countries, either you have the startup or the big groups. Take Japan. Startups are not so important in Japan. The innovation system of Japan is made by big groups. About the same is Germ in Germany, mainly, although startups are important. In France, also, there is a mixture of what does the big groups and what does uh, the startups. And they, they, there is among the students in France an extremely great today willingness of having startups. But, by the way, what is very interesting is what is really the field where the leadership of the United States appears to be totally dominant. It's clearly the internet-related companies. The Google, the Facebook, the Twitter. No European company has ever started recently to be uh, even, I mean, comparable, comparable to these companies. But one point is very interesting. Are those companies winning China? Answer, no. Alibaba, Xiaomi, well, I've seen that Apple is selling a lot in China, but uh, whenever you sell in China, anyway, you sell a lot. And so uh, uh, it, it's not totally relevant. Uh, don't, don't forget, China produces half of the cement of the planet, half of the glass of the planet, 90% of high-speed train. Chinese companies now are getting out and buying at premium foreign companies. They bought at a very high premium Club Mediterranean. They recently bought at a very high premium uh, the airport of Toulouse. And it's only the beginning. Now we are going to go to a, a place where the Chinese company are not only dominating and getting huge amount of money from their Chinese operation, but also are now starting to buy foreign companies. And they are mainly doing it uh, mostly in Europe because the political resistance is much lower than in the United States. And so they are trying to buy in Europe as quick as, uh, as they can. What about the others? If you take the United States and China, there is no real other countries which are going to be at the same level. Russia is more and more concentrating on itself and trying to get political influence in this area. They are going to get their share of Ukraine, they are going to keep that. But economically, they are not at all at the level of the States or at the level of China. If you take India, India is good in a few areas, but India, like Brazil, has the chances, the chance, and the disadvantage of democracy. Uh, they are very, they have bad, bad uh, infrastructure, because to get an infrastructure, whether it's in Brazil or it is in India, it, it's very complicated. In China, I mean, the way is very simple. I mean, they say. Here is the road, and everybody out, and everybody is out in about three weeks. So it's, uh, uh, of course, they are going much quicker than anyone. So uh, there is no comparison. I personally think that neither Brazil, which for a businessman is a very good country to go, by the way, nor India, although people think India, because of their people, will be um, as big uh, or challenge to China one day. I, I don't at all think that, personally. So, you have not that, 
you have no African, count, African uh, country which is at that level. Of course, the strongest was South Africa, but now they are a bit leaving off. Nigeria has huge resources, but is not organized. Egypt was a strong company, but has been losing ground with their recent events. And you have then small companies, Morocco, uh, Algeria, or uh, new ones like uh, Angola, or uh, of interesting to go there. If you want to go to small com countries, it's very interesting. You can go to, for example, Ethiopia. It's a very well good place to invest. It's the same. As a company, I, I, don't, uh, I don't recommend to companies to invest too much in China because the Chinese competition is dramatic. It's so much easier to make money in India. But that does not mean that Chinese and Chinese companies are not growing. This is why for Western companies, be prudent on China. Invest in Indonesia, invest in Malaysia, invest in Vietnam, invest in Ethiopia. That's where you are going to make money. Uh, you are not going to make that much money uh, sometimes in China. Or you have a good business model in China, you make money, you stay 12, 15 years, you take your money and you run. And that is the best, <laughs> the best policy uh, to do as a businessman in, in China, in, in my view. Now, I finish in Europe. Uh, Europe will have, Europe is really getting less influence, less power, less money, less everything. Europe, uh, the Germans themselves are, will get weaker because they have technical competition now from uh, Eastern, from, uh, from uh, for example, South Korea and other. I've been five years member of the board of Siemens, one of the largest German companies. So I've seen that very, I mean, really for five years, the competition. And it's clear that there'll be big challenges even to Germany from uh, the technologies of, the, of Asian countries and mainly the raising of China and the raising of, uh, of uh, South Korea. And in some aspects, India. Because India has some very, very good specialty in software. Why? Because software travel by air. And they don't travel through air, through highways. Uh, <laughs> the highway between Bangalore and uh, Chennai is a drama. But if you put your software by uh, satellite, uh, it's perfect. So, uh, of course, uh, India will be a great country in software companies. One of the best, perhaps the best. But that is not enough. So, in Europe, my view is very clear. There is no way out, no future for Europe without the strong islands between France and Germany. Why this alliance is not taking clear, clear place? Because the French have not convinced presently the Germans that they are going to make the needed reforms. Not yet. The German will wait somewhat. And uh, in my view, with a certain time, the French will make the reforms. Because they have also no way out except making necessary reforms which are not intellectually very difficult. If you want to explain to a minister what reforms you pay him a ticket to go to Berlin and to go to Geneva or to go to somewhere in Sweden, and he knows exactly the reforms to make. A problem is to have the courage to make the reforms, but the technicalities are extremely well known already. So I think that will happen. I think Europe should go <coughs> really back to a smaller Europe, much more federalist, federalist, much more integrated on, a, of course, Franco-Germany, and of course, around it, or with it, Italy, Spain, Belgium. I'm less sure of the Netherlands, because they have a British trend, which I always suspect. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I strongly believe in Poland also to be part of that central, uh, I mean, that network of Europe, which will be 
if, if something is made on a unitary way and well managed and everything, which means, of course, not with the European Commission, uh, I believe that this Commission would be even worse than Barroso Commission, which was nearly the bottom of uh, the system. But uh, we'll see. Anyway, bon, then you have the Greece experience, which we don't know where it's going to bring and how it's going to speed up. But basically, uh, you are going to be, to be in a world which will be dominated by the face-à-face -face of China and United States. Uh, it's going to be not fun. Uh, it's going to be a bit morose, we say in France. And China is going to eat each day a little of United States. But the United States are so capable of renovating themselves through immigration, through their dynamism. It's, of course, extreme capitali capitalism. is getting less and less equal. It's getting more and more unequal each day. But it's still extremely vivid. So that's, in my view, the world you are going to live. Companies, of course, uh, will have to do what they do. And uh, the big challenges of any company everywhere will be Chinese competition and internet-related competition. If you are a CEO today, you have only to work on those two items, China, internet. And internet is a bit complicated in a company because there is, and that will be my conclusion, uh, generation gap. So basically, if you want to make reform in internet, you let aside everybody above 40, and you only give power to people under 40. Or uh, the others don't understand. I don't understand. So thank you very much for your <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you. We would like to thank uh, the presenter, Jean-Louis Beffa, for giving a fantastic presentation on the outcome of globalization and what's going on in the world today. Uh, I'm Alexandre Gutman, as you guys know, and this is Maria uh, Rubsova. And uh, today we're going to present the book that uh, Jean-Louis Beffa wrote. Ah, uh, yes. OK. Uh, so the outline of our presentation is we're going to give a brief introduction on what the company Saint-Gobain is, which is the company he was running. And uh, we're also going to give a summary about the book, uh, Le France doit choisir, uh, choisir, France must choose, and basically talk about what the book is about and what conclusions it came up with. Uh, and then we have some comments and some critiques on the book. Uh, and then, of course, Maria is going to explain a more left-wing uh, approach to the critiques that we have. And then we'll have some questions for you. And of course, hopefully these questions will foster a discussion. OK, so uh, a little bit about Jean-Louis Beffa. Uh, he was the chief director of Saint-Gobain since 1986. Uh, and uh, since then, basically, that was when the company became uh, privatized from a nationalist uh, approach. And uh, during this transition from na uh, a nationalized to a privatized company, uh, the company changed drastically. Uh, Jean-Louis Beffa introduced uh, new mechanisms of uh, investing in research and development to bring more uh, high-tech uh, equipments within the company. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that the company was a construction-based uh, company and that it produced a lot of cement. Uh, originally, it was a producer of mirrors, but uh, not they have... Too, not too much cement, but uh, somewhat related to other materials. Oh, okay. So no problem. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, well, there are varieties of construction materials. In France, Lafarge is the producer of cement. I tried to merge with them three times. <laughs> <laughs> Not successful. I nearly make a tender offer on her. And now recently they have merged with the uh, big Swiss Holcim company in cement. Oh, okay. And I told them that uh, instead of becoming, becoming Swiss, they should have stayed French with me. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a very big company, Saint-Gobain, and uh, they have operations in over 50 different countries. Uh, as you mentioned, they employ over 185,000 employees, and they're worth 42 billion euros. 
so it's a huge company, and the fact that they uh, invested in research and development made them a, a very high-tech company and a major economic actor at this day and age of globalization. Um, and uh, I guess we can move on to the next slide. Uh, I'll let you take it. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, as we uh, had mostly the book to prepare for the discussion, where we are reacting to the book in this uh, discussion. Uh, so I'll summarize what the book uh, La France doit choisir was about. So it was um, so the book, there were three parts in the book. The first was kind of a, a typology of different types of firms and how firms are governed. Then the second part was really about globalization and the biggest economies in the globalization. And the third part was more <coughs> about policy recommendations for France and Europe. And so the main conclusions of the book were that to, um, to exploit the competitive advantage of a country, there should be a harmony between the strategies of the government and of firms, that is to say, uh, the development of industry and all uh, could not come only from a private initiative, but there was a need for uh, public uh, actions, or policies, or incentives to develop uh, big uh, companies and industries and to get them to export. And uh, also, what I found interesting was that uh, the amount of power given to shareholders is crucial. That is to say. Um, uh, in the book, uh, you argue that the fact of giving too much power to shareholders and not to other stakeholders, such as representatives of uh, employees and all, it was noxious to the long-term strategies of the firms, in particular in France. And uh, the, those you talked about in the presentation, the fact that France tried to follow a model prescribed by uh, the US and the UK, basically, and that this was accompanied by a, a loss of uh, industrial power and a loss of, uh, exp of uh, exporting firms. And so you argue that we should, like to, uh, we should come back to a, a commercial industrial model like Germany to become more mercantilist and get to export more. Okay. So, and uh, in the book you make uh, concrete propositions for France, like yes, uh, include all stakeholders to uh, the management of the firms, uh, to reduce the cost of policies in favor of consumers and uh, for the state to think more of the interests and the strategies of the firms, uh, to promote uh, the, the industry favoring domestic production and exportation as opposed to, because in the national accounts, if a French firm opens a plant in another country, and imports the goods which are, which are produced there, it's not counted in the domestic product of France. So uh, that's the point between uh, the difference between investing in another country or opening a, firm, um, um, a plant in another country and producing at home and exporting. So you agree that there should be some incentive in France to, um, to help uh, exporting firms open in France and uh, we are going for a new and, and policy about energy. We are going to talk about this uh, later in the slide. <coughs> uh, to have a, what you call a long-term vision of the debt. We are going to discuss it later too. And uh, to uh, <coughs> basically, yes, pr 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 um, help firms as opposed to uh, employees as to taxation. Uh, so now I pass the ground to Alexandre for the kind of liberal critique uh, of the comments. Uh, there's a couple of uh, things that I agree with you in the framework of France in the context of globalization. Uh, I do agree with you that instead of being in a shareholder dominated system where we only focus on uh, profit maximizing and uh, the shareholders obtaining all these profits for themselves and completely forgetting about other actors, I do think that we should move on to a more stakeholder implicated system. Uh, and that, of course, would include uh, giving rise to the consumers, to the little firms, uh, to certain government agencies, uh, to the general public, uh, to making good uh, decisions in terms of how to manage the economy and how to manage the economy based in a globalized context. Um, also, I do agree that when you look at some export-driven industries, it is important to uh, include the government 
according to Han Jung Chang, uh, he points out that in the history of, of exporting activities, uh, no company has been able to export or do business internationally without any public action. So that's the government, that is. And so, of course, I agree on these points that we must include stakeholders and we must include uh, governments in some, uh, some acquisitions. Uh, however, I would still like to point out that uh, there are some things from the neoliberal model that is mostly used in the United States and the UK uh, that should be used in the context of France in order for them to become a, a key actor in globalization. And uh, I will actually talk about this in the next slide. Uh, I, may, I may be taking a very big risk here, but coming from, looking at this book, I realized that perhaps you might have a potential bias. <laughs> uh, that perhaps uh, all service economies are, are uh, sort of not very tradable in this economic context. They are low value added and uh, that they're not very tradable. And I would understand this point of view looking at France because if you look at most of the services, uh, they tend to be very localized and only for within a certain population and they don't bring up any uh, incomes from international activities. Uh, but the truth is that when you look at the internet revolution, and what companies have been able to do in this context, you realize that service economies are actually very high value added companies, and they provide a lot of tradable uh, possibilities for the country. Um, I bring up the example of banking. Uh, when you look at banking before the internet revolution, everything was localized. You would go to your local bank to perform transactions, to come up with new solutions with uh, your credit account or whatever. But now, everything is done online. So for example, if I'm a Citibank uh, customer, um, I'm going to talk to a customer representative in Malaysia or uh, China. And therefore, it becomes more internationalized. And uh, that means that there is much more high value added and there's a lot more communication within this process that perhaps can make France an even more global leader. Um, also, yeah, as I said, the services become high value added, which means, which translates to uh, higher wages and more high paid jobs. And in the context of France, I think they could use this sort of, of uh, vision to provide more income to the people of France. And uh, I also wanted to point out that, yes, of course, France is behind when it comes to service economies. Uh, in Europe, in general, I'd say that Germany is a little bit better. And of course, the United States and China are leading service economies. So the France, France needs to join this, uh, this bandwagon. Uh, and so when I look at the uh, neoliberal model, uh, I realize that uh, there are certain things that it does better for smaller actors, stakeholders, than this commercial industrial model that you portray in your book. Um, it's true that the industrial model, okay, the industrial commercial model supports the industry giants, which means that uh, when you look at certain industries, uh, there's big actors that actually get the support from the government, but then a lot of smaller actors are not really included. And this makes the general industry weaker when you put it in the global context. Um, and of course, when you give more power to the industry giants, uh, this leads to an oligopolistic competition, which may be good for some actors to, to uh, do investment around the world. But for the general uh, framework of France, uh, it could lead to some disadvantages. And um, when I want to bring up some things from the neoliberal model, I'm looking specifically at startup companies that are able to produce high value added services. Uh, and uh, I feel like in the book you undermine that, that idea that uh, the startup companies are unable to innovate or unable to create any sort of uh, foreign direct investment or income for the country. But of course, this is open to debate. I just wanted to bring up the example of Facebook, for example. Facebook was a startup company that was from, a, from the Zuckerberg family. Uh, it was a small investment that turned into a huge global service that everybody uses. Uh, and this is an example of a high value added service that can be used in the context of globalization to empower countries. Um, and also, I feel like with the commercial industrial model, uh, you sort of ignore some of the ideas of finance that really help small businesses and the country in general. And I want to refer to specifically microfinance and uh, financial regulations. And I just want to say that not all forms of finance within the neoliberal model is bad. Um, if you don't know what microfinance is, it's basically uh, the ability for financial services for entrepreneurs and small businesses to have access to banking and related other related services. And they typically do this through the delivery of uh, a relationship uh, based on the banking of an individual or a business or a group of individuals and businesses working together to make uh, an acquisition. 
And uh, they also use group-based models, so basically different uh, actors, enterprises, uh, individuals working together and uh, working, to basically collaborating to come up with a, a, a desired outcome. Uh, next slide. Now, also, in the book, you definitely uh, promote shale gas, and uh, Wait, I have shale some gas. Maybe I, shale gas, I just think that <coughs> France should have tried one experiment, but not, we are not sure that, first, we don't know the resources. Secondly, I don't think that in France, shale gas is the interesting thing. I think shale oil around Paris, east of Paris, is the most ge 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 geologically interesting and I, I, I don't want to say that we should now uh, do shale gas but we should do one experiment that's all okay okay uh, interesting um, well okay shale gas <laughs> it's gonna be this is gonna be a tough one now but uh, basically what I wanted to say is that shale gas should not be so promoted because uh, it interferes with France's nuclear industry which as you explained before drives the prices of electricity down for the consumers. And uh, also, uh, shale gas, to me, is not too economically effective when you want to put France in a more empowered position in the context of globalization. And uh, when you look at the Europe shales that exist, uh, they are very, very deep. They are usually spread out. They're in smaller portions. And they're also, also much more pressurized. So the production, the actual process of fracking, becomes much more expensive and actually much more environmentally damaging, though I will leave the floor to Maria to explain that. And so in the end, when you lead to production, um, when you use uh, shale gas to produce, uh, it's not that economically effective, and I think it will not necessarily put France in a stronger position. Um, and it's also very, very expensive when you compare it to oil. Uh, also, my beef with shale gas is that uh, it still contributes to the problem of, of climate change, and that it emits CO2. And uh, if you want to become a leading uh, energy uh, producer, you have to look at new <coughs> alternative renewable energy resources. And I think now is the right time to invest. But I'll give that explanation to you. Okay, so uh, now uh, I wanted to call this part the Babakul critique because that's, what, that's what, how you call the kind of uh, hard left-wing parties in the book. So uh, uh, I think that uh, your analysis of globalization is very interesting. I just wanted to react to some points, maybe to launch the discussion afterwards with, uh, with our audience here. So um, both in the book and maybe in uh, the presentation you gave today, uh, the, the inter your interpretation of globalization was mostly about how to be or to stay a world power, a big economy in the international competition. And um, you interpret is uh, this as uh, the struggle between countries for access to rare resources, in particular uh, energy, raw materials and all, and uh, the national exporting industries are considered as uh, the way to take part in this struggle. And, but uh, what, I, um, what you said a little bit today, but, um, a lot in the book, I want to direct to the fact of interpreting like Brazil or India's poverty or even democracy as uh, drawbacks to, uh, to the international competition instead of uh, reducing poverty or getting a democratic regime as an aim as itself, as I would consider. <laughs> and uh, also the fact that uh, you, cri you criticize policies too much in favor of the consumers uh, as just uh, costly and useless things. But I would say that the, welf the welfare of uh, the population and the uh, social justice in general should be the goals of public policy and not just being a uh, world power. And maybe it's not the priority to uh, try to stay in the global competition if it, if it makes, uh, if it worsens the living conditions of uh, the population that lives in the country. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, also in, the, in, in these uh, policies in favor of the consumers, you uh, classified <coughs> all the policies of protecting the environment, for instance, so the shale gas, but uh, I will not insist too long on that, uh, since you said you, uh, you're not in favor of the views of uh, shale gas now. But um, uh, shale, shale gas is, uh, produces a lot of greenhouse gases and not only CO2. 
Uh, and I would say to that that uh, pres preserving the environment is not just something to please the consumers, but on the one hand, it is uh, just a matter of survival and of preserving the planet, and it's not only in favor of uh, consumers, but in the long run, it's, uh, it's important for, for us all, and not only consumers and producers, but all the whole world population is dependent on the future of the environment. So I would not say that it's good on the short term to uh, reduce the cost of environmental policies if, if it can save us all in the long term. And also, so I will be quick on that because you didn't talk about it today in your presentation, but in the book you said that the public debt is uh, an intergenerational burden and that uh, instead we should have a long-term vision of the debt. But I would consider that the debt, it's not only kind of a black hole in, into uh, which deficits fall and uh, it gets bigger and bigger, but the debt has a counterpart because when someone owes money, someone uh, uh, should receive money when he gives it back with the interest. So uh, I mean, for me, the debt is uh, an intragenerational problem of repetition and not uh, an intergenerational problem. And uh, uh, kind of the uh, same argument about the consumers versus the producers about um, so this is the more post keynesian uh, critique. So yes, the, you say that the increase of wages in France uh, favored the consumer, but the governments did not think about the French producer and uh, this uh, entailed too high costs for firms to hire people. But I, I believe that the wages uh, also have a counterpart, they generate consumption, which creates demand for the firms, so uh, I, I don't think that uh, decreasing uh, costs, uh, wage costs for the firms would be a good thing for the economy as a whole, and in particular in the midst of a crisis what benefits an individual firm may be bad for the economy as a whole, and it's true also for the competition between the countries, if a country like Germany uh, decreases its um, wages, it may be good for Germany, but uh, if we all do, like Germany, in kind of a competition in, in terms of wage costs between the countries, it's going to be depress the global, uh, it's going to depress the global demand. So I will not advocate this kind of uh, policy. And uh, yes, and about the Babakul parties arriving to power, I will conclude on the fact that uh, let's see if uh, the Syriza in Greece, uh, what are going to be uh, the economic consequences of uh, this kind of um, parties in power. So now to the questions. So we are launching the discussions so or questions are mostly to you. Or if I may have some comments. No, you ask the question first. No? Yeah, Maybe. we um, we, we end up these comments with questions, then you have the choice to answer them and then gather questions. Okay, because I, <coughs> I may have to requalify what I was supposed to think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we have two slides of questions now. So. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, well, I'm from New York City, which is like the land of high-tech services, and I see how powerful they are in the context of the world. No, no, I'm not. Uh, I mean, that is one point. I'm, I'm fully in support of uh, startups and fully in support of, uh, of, uh, I, uh, of uh, services uh, of high-tech services. Okay, I, my question for you. I have not uh, the slightest uh, things. I even think that. Uh, Big groups, presently, I have organized my group before I left, uh, about uh, six or seven years ago, uh, because uh, I thought that the new ideas will come from the startup. So I have made a special organization to deal with the startup. Because the startup, uh, if you let it by your re own researchers, they are a bit jealous. If you did it by the operational people, they want to immediately buy the company. Or a startup is a very delicate object. So I put a team of people specialized in negotiating with startups. And I screen for a company 200 startups in the planet. I, uh, I s had discussion with 70 and I made 20 deals. So I basically think the creation will be in the startup the creative part, but big companies have the power to produce quickly, to develop quickly, and to sell much more quickly. So pick the idea to the startup and get it for you. That's the best way. Well, 
I mean, yeah, my question, my question for in this context then, and I'm glad that you support high tech startups because uh, I'm, I'm wondering how France will be able to uh, create high tech services, given uh, the context it is in. Because as I look right now, the services, as you mentioned before, is far behind even Germany, for example. And so, uh, given the fact that uh, you know. <coughs> There's a global demand. No, no, no. It's, it's very easy to answer because I've made the statistics. And you can take even where the services are extremely high in the trade. Like, for example, India in uh, their services, software. Or you can have also the biggest, the two biggest country with the highest share of services in the trade balance in the net services are India and United Kingdom for finance services. When you compare it to their deficit in their energy and industry, you just find the numbers are not matching. So I only advise you to come back to your book of statistics and do the same as I did. And you find that contrary to what you might think, it's very difficult to get big numbers in services uh, because they are mainly not exported or uh, by just by themselves. But do you believe that? But I believe that should be done. I believe they should be grow. I believe uh, they will be very important in... Uh, I, I believe the employment is only a problem of services. Employment is not a problem of industry. Industrial uh, employment is never the problem. The problem is services, and in services, of course, if you've got high-tech services, it's interesting. I think the French are well positioned, mainly because we are good mathematicians, compared to others in the planet. So we should, no, not Polytechnic, uh, normal <laughs> soup is even better. But uh, we, 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 we are really uh, trained to be good mathematicians. So we should be good in software. And I have recently always advised the government to push very much software companies in France. The problem is that because of the size of France, they cannot grow very much. The good companies immediately move to the States. And if they are very good in France, they are bought immediately by French companies because we don't have the investor's money tuned to the startup. The startup, uh, I mean, the people financing the startups uh, are technicians understanding the business in the States. In France, they are bankers who don't understand. But uh, basically, this is why the startup business, even in good software, has difficulty to make company like uh, Facebook. If you want to grow, you can only go to the U.S. Yeah, no, of course. But that's why I actually mention uh, microfinance in this case, because these are, this is a very good financial tool to, to bring up the uh, power of startups. Of course, it requires... is not a big number. That's true, but if, given the context of globalization and implicating many stakeholders, you can absorb from different, uh, different sources a strong enough uh, acquisition to make these services actually that, financially... That's a bit uh, optimistic. <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. And actually, you have a tendency to I, be... I prefer not to have a Warren Buffett but, uh, <laughs> uh, for financing me that microfinance. Understood. It was just an idea as I was reading really oh, the no, book. No, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that was actually my next question. No, no, no. It's not bad. And uh, with the industrial my initial model... Microfinance is, is interesting. It's growing because a lot of micro makes a big thing. But at the end of the day, it's still a minority approach compared to the rest. Uh, but uh, the industrial model, uh, the startup spirit's support and development is integral, is integral part of the industrial model. I call it industrial, but uh, I should call it, uh, well, maybe a different way. Uh, the world to stress too much industrial is perhaps a bit too much. Because then people think I underestimate startup, I underestimate service, which is not my thinking. I, I think, uh, but it is because, uh, I mean, the, in France, everybody says it's only startup. Then they forget the big groups. Uh, in France also, they always say service. In fact, they forget industry. So I put uh, industry because I wanted to stress what is lacking. But it's not only an industrial problem. 
if I may say. How to show the industry that the government should support? Never the government. I, I, I was made by President Chirac head of an agency, which was uh, an agency to finance projects for R&D support. My view was that the government should not support industry. The government, my view was that the project would receive money if it was done by first a company which is already solid in its existing business and of a certain size. Because if you don't have the size, you don't have uh, the export mine, you don't have the network and everything. So it was company, let's say, starting at about one billion sales. It's not startup, it's not the big ones, it's not the big groups, it's not the 40 million. It was one million. And the, and the best project came from the smaller companies, what they call ETI in France, uh, Company Moyenne. No, and basically, I don't want the support. Uh, only their objective was that they had a project which, where research could be done in France, could be produced in France competitively, and could export. And that's all. They could sell potatoes if they want potatoes. The government is extremely badly placed to say this industry must be supported. Let the company put forward their project, because if it is their project, then they'll be putting their own money. And anyway, uh, and anyway uh, the government was giving only one third. The company had to pay for itself so 62 third. But, uh, but uh, that agency was a bit too much, uh, I mean, the government interference in the liberal market. So uh, it was created by President Chirac and it was suppressed by President Sarkozy. And now it uh, was reborn under President Holland. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, actually, I had one more question. Uh, I didn't put it in the slide, but as I was listening to your presentation, mm -hmm. it sort of came in my head. Uh, in what way, uh, how can France basically establish relations with countries like China or the United States to you know, have an ability to join the, the global market and make itself uh, you know, an actual producer of goods and services? What do you say, oh, you say join? What do you mean by like, join? Uh, basically the kinds of trade deals that they can organize between China and uh, sort of the oh, providing yeah, you can, you can establish uh, yourself. Saint-Gobain has a eight billion dollar business in the United States. And in China only 1.5. No, this is... No, but, but basically myself, uh, for example, I am not very much in favor of the Transatlantic Trade Treaty. Because I think uh, there, there are two things I oppose. One is this sort of system where when there is a problem between a state and an industry, then there is another body. Because I think this body will be too much American influenced. My second view is that uh, I think we are doing, uh, we're for the world which I project, we are doing things a little too close to the Americans. I would try to do a deal with the Chinese. I basically think that the French, for the world which is building, should be like was General de Gaulle, who was the first to recognize China. We should be more trying to do deals with China if we want to a little counterbalance the uh, oligistic power of people like Google. I would like that we work with, uh, if the French companies would do something, let's work a little with Alibaba. Just to, uh, I mean, the don't let Google be so strong. That will be my view. Very interesting. Thank you. <coughs> okay. uh, so maybe I'll start with the second question because it's more general. So I wanted to ask if, um, well, we didn't talk a lot about energy today, but I think the very original and interesting point in the book was that you argued that the resources of raw materials and in particular energy are limited and therefore this increases the competition between Im countries that import these materials and uh, that's why it's necessary to have a commercial surplus in order to be able to import like oil and, uh, and this kind of materials and uh, 
The consequences of falling oil price will be double. It will significantly reduce the investments in shale oil in the United States, at least for a certain moment, and it's going to reassess the power of Saudi Arabia. And the countries which are going to be it are going to be the Russians, the Algerians, the Venezuelans, and some countries in the, in the East, even Daesh, for example, because their oil is going to be sold much, much more cheaply, and they have budget problems. Even Kuwait is getting a deficit. So it's a political and economic reassessment of the power of Saudi Arabia, which, by the way, is n I'm not sure it's so much liked by the United States. And I don't, I think the answer of what's happening is really something which is difficult to understand because I'm not a specialist and I'm not part of the secret services. Uh, the relationship on that aspect between the United States and Saudi Arabia, is it made somewhat in a kind of agreement between the US and Saudi Arabia? Or is it really a purely Saudi Arabian movement, which then for me would be a bit of a surprise? It's, I would say, definitely the U.S. influencing Saudi Arabia to uh, lower the power of Iran in terms of oil development and, of course, Russia. But yeah. that's Russia, that's things like that. So somewhat the United States are sacrifice, sacrificing their shale oil, keeping not touching too much their shale gas and is going to weaken all oil producers. And as you said, mainly, mainly the biggest hit will be country like Iran, like, of course, uh, Russia, and, by the way, which for the U.S. is not too bad, Venezuela. Those, those countries will be near bankrupt. In Brazil, I don't think we'll pass the year. Okay. But, but frankly, nobody, nobody thought that that movement were going to arrive. Really, uh, you ask a lot of people, the biggest surprise has been the, the, the oil. Because it's not a natural moment uh, of offer and demand. It's a pure political action by Saudi Arabia. But the idea of orientating the economy towards a more green economy, not relying on oil, etc. The green economy, uh, the green economy, uh, there are they are, they are very, <laughs> there are very different things to be done. Uh, for example, the most costly green economy policy is Germany, and when discuss, you discuss to Germany. And you discuss with Germans, and you say, uh, you are going to, to I mean, pay your energy double, for example, what France is going to pay for its consumer energy. They say, we don't care. You are paying double the price of uh, an apartment. So why shouldn't we pay <laughs> double the price of energy? It's just a balance. And then will be the best for green energy. And that is what the answer you receive uh, from Germany. Or to say it differently, to make such a costly energy policy, you must have the money of Germany. Poor France cannot afford it. <laughs> <laughs> but oil prices are low because they're artificially kept low, because there are subsidies on oil, not because it's so high, uh, it's so low anyway. No, I mean, I mean, the, I mean the, renew the renewable cost of renewables in Germany. For the rest, what can you say it again, please? Uh, I'm saying the cost of um, the non-renewable sources of energy is low because it's artificially kept low by subsidies through government on oil and fossil fuels and natural gas, everything. If Where? you remove those subsidies, Where? Where? well, almost everywhere in the world. Well, in the world, if you want, uh, if really you want, uh, you want to extract oil from uh, Saudi Arabia, it costs you ten dollar per barrel. That's not too high. I mean, I mean, I mean, never, never. 
I mean, you, you may like renewable energy, but never it's going to be the less costly energy. It's going, always <laughs> going to be a costly energy. The second point is, if you really have an optimization, which I think is of great interest in renewable energy, you really have to find a way to store electricity. That should be the biggest investments in R&D to be done in the planet. But you are going to, you may use, for example, uh, solar energy in an extremely nice way in, in, in Africa. In Africa, I mean, you, then because you are going to make very small grid, you are going to make just a, just a, a, a solar energy just for a village. And they are going to use that energy, and before they had nothing. And you could not put energy in a village in Africa uh, with a, a huge amount of infrastructure. So there are new ways of using energy, and I personally think renewable energy will have a great future. But by the way, it will have a great future where you have su sun, and where you don't have sun in, in, in Europe is Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, let's continue just to finish and then gather more questions. Thank you. Do we gather the questions? No. Yes, one last written on the slide. I just thought you the reforms that France should do, and I wanted to ask. Would it be not preferable to put all estate efforts in the first frame? I think we just discussed that already. No, that's just what we talked about. About the labor market and the wages and all, you talked about the reforms that should be made. And I think you are quite close to the current Socialist Party in power, like advising Hollande, advising Montebourg. You thank Xavier Rago in the book for helping you write it. He advised uh, Montebourg too. He's quite no, close no, to the Socialist Party. Now he's head of OFC, one of the biggest uh, yes. economic think tank in France. Yes, but he's considered as left wing and still he is working Rago, on. Rago, left wing? Yes. <laughs> as much as I. Uh, that's, that's the thing. I'm the only Marx, Marxist CEO, you have understood. So yes, uh, I was just wanted to ask uh, concretely what do you think should be the right reforms, like uh, in terms of liberal contracts, yes, wages? Really, uh, for example, uh, we 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 had that, we had that this reduction of. Uh, I think we have a, we have one problem. We still have we still have too high. Uh, the uh, the low wage limit is still too high in France compared, a bit too high. Secondly, we should we should we should basically reduce the charges on the labor. We should really it's much better to tax the consumer and uh, and lift the taxes on the labor. The labor should not be taxed. Why the labor is so much tax in France? If you really want. Basically, I mean, uh, one thing should be written in big letters. If you don't have a company which is using technology, capital, and labor to produce added value, how are you going to pay the civil servants and the retirees? So, basically, you must liberate all the forces of production in France. That's all. And reduce all the others. Cut the retiree and cut the uh, civil servants. The, are you talking also about the amount of civil servants? I mean, it's, it's, so, it's, so, it's, so, it's so obvious that the problem of France is it's not producing enough value from the use of labor, technology, and capital. It's the same thing for capital. It's France, as you know, uh, put a sparing dans la assurance vie, 18% of their income. It goes, it doesn't go to financing uh, the economy. It goes to financing some kind of rent and everything like that. Cut that. Force the insurance companies to invest in financing companies at low cost. And for the rest, tax them. I mean, we, 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 we are conducting ourselves if we were a rent economy, an economy of old, let's kill the old in France. No, I'm joking. Okay, um, no, I, I, I think we are advantaging too much the established people. 
too much the civil servants, which are not producing, and too much the uh, retirees. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, the retirees have done, uh, and uh, it's unjust because the situation is such that nobody in France is going to be as happy as what was before. Everybody is going to make sacrifice. That's what I say with the old people and everything like that. Uh, everybody is going to make sacrifice. And for the time being, nobody has really started to make the right sacrifice. So what's happening is the producing system is blocked. You must unblock the producing system, or you're not going to find the money to finance anything. Everything is good. I mean, every rule is nice. But I don't know if you have started a uh, startup company. After I retired, I started a startup company for giving advice. I can tell you, it's dramatic, the papers you have to do. The regulations are absolutely dramatic in France compared to other countries. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we go to the question. We can come back here if you want. We ended the discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, so I, I assume this is going to be a lot of presentation. So for the first round, just one question. So we start with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Nabru, Wemi, Kale, and Karen. Just one question. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Do you need a um, paper or something like that? No. Okay. I was just wondering that you said that we need a smaller and more integrated Europe. I'm thinking, do you think that's regressive to go back to a smaller integrated Europe? Because Europe is expanding because of of its ambition to be a major common <coughs> bloc, not because it pitied the small countries and wanted to include them. So what are your views on that? Be, be, because, be, because there is, a, when you are expanding Europe at 27 countries and giving them the, about the same power, for example, of blockade, the system is blocked. We have integrated in Europe two different companies. We should come back, if we want to act, to companies which have enough similarities between themselves. Do you think that's why? Mm -hmm. What? Uh, do you think that's why? I, I, mean, I mean from the economic point of view. From a political point of view, I think Europe at 27 is very nice. We should protect themselves. Europe is a way of, I mean, we have values which are totally common in Europe. And I don't exclude, uh, for example, if I criticize some economy or in Bulgaria or Romania, I don't exclude them from what I think is Europe. But I should exclude them of common policies in economy. Because we are not, common policies in, in economy are needed and they can only be done with companies which are enough similar between themselves. Um, my question ties on um, the different practices between um, Western and Eastern companies, and that's why it also affects the relationship between the government, <coughs> the policy makers, and the firms itself. Because how, how, what are the likelihood of big firms in the Western world, say in Europe, um, to bring back their gains to their home countries? Unlike in the East, mostly Eastern firms, they have very strong national pride and nationalism. I think that in Europe, uh, the nationalism uh, has been, especially in France, being too much diminished. And I think there should be a much, a much bigger, solid, to get out of the problems we have, a much bigger solidarity and nationalism in this country. But nationalism must be, uh, it's not nationalism uh, like the Front National, uh, in my view. It's nationalism by common sacrifice. I, I, I was very disappointed that there was not an agreement between the representatives of the owner of companies and the unions for that. I'm a great admirer of the way Germany works by the common work of unions and uh, management. And by the way, the link between unions and management in Germany is in fact Germany. <coughs> there is much more nationalism in German companies or there is in French companies. Can, can, 
Um, my question is actually more re related um, also then to Germany because they're really like important for small and medium sized companies and I feel like you emphasize so much on big multinational companies as their champions which their con countries compete on in the power relations. Um, but like those big multinationals at least in Germany are nothing without the small and medium size because it's at the end the network of those things. So and I'm wondering how does this apply to France because I don't know uh, how this actually no, basically we have not enough of this kind of middle stand uh, we have in Germany and it's very difficult to build up. It's very difficult to build up. Most of the owners uh, don't want somewhat to grow their company. They, they, they have not the same attitude. Uh, a very significant number of, uh, let's say, small companies want sometimes to stay their size because they are a bit afraid to go to the other way. So there is not a natural growing of companies to kind of emulate the German Mittelstand, which is your strength. Uh, in France, I'm much more optimistic about uh, what could be done uh, in service by startups, especially internet related. I think we are better than Germany in this field. Uh, so basically, uh, Let's say that, let's skip to Germany industry and let's skip to France services. Uh, high tech services, like you said. And, and, I, and I think we'll be very complimentary. Well, there is one thing which we have in France, uh, I should have asked, is l'art de vivre. L'art de vivre. We have the, we have the, well, look Paris. It's much nicer than many other countries. <laughs> look, uh, look, 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 look the uh, weather. Look the and go to Beijing, and you uh, you'll choose immediately or to Kuala Lumpur, even Pina, even Pina, even Penang, even Penang. So, first, first we have that. Look, look again. Uh, look, secondly, our coast. Go to the coast of Spain. Go to the coast of Italy and compare it to Brittany. It's beautifully kept in France. Second point, go to a restaurant. Where would you go? To England or you go to France? <laughs> you go to France. <laughs> Especially in the countryside where it's not very costly. So, culture. How many people, uh, have you seen how many theatres are playing in Paris today? If you look for the weekend, look how many offers you have to go to the opera. Five operas. London has two, English National and Covent Garden, and uh, New York has two. So, what we are very good at is l'art de vivre, the way of life. That we like. So, what's the way to make that money? Prepare ourselves for high level, with a lot of money, Chinese tourist. That is, that is, we should not make an industrial plan to develop France. We should make a big organization to receive rich Chinese tourists. <laughs> that is the best way. But we should take an advantage. And why the French don't like so much to work? They, they, the French work very, very well in a short time because <laughs> they have, they have they have don't long hours of work, but during these hours they work twice, a nearly twice the Japanese when you see them. Why? Because we want time for the l'art de vivre. We want, we want a good balance. <laughs> okay, so we move to the next question. <laughs> okay, thanks for the talk. And I wanted to go back a bit at the beginning when you were talking about state intervention. You said that the state in a normal phase of industrial development, let's say the current phase, should only set the framework for businesses yes. to thrive on their own. And I was wondering if these conditions to thrive include also investment in human capital, so in public education, healthcare, unemployment support, pensions, and as you mentioned now, culture, or if these services should actually be left to the private sector? No, no, not at all. Uh, I, I, think we are, I think we could have a larger part of private sector in the elf uh, in France. We are too much presently by this government, in my view, uh, being a real uh, state organization. And we should put more competition between private clinic and state hospital. 
Uh, for education, uh, I think clearly education is, is a major point. But the problem of education is really education for, um, for, 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 for people uh, to, to have very I mean, useful, simple work. And I do believe very much. In France, we have too much separation between uh, the education system and the companies. So training, uh, halfway working while also you study, this kind of system must be emphasized. L'apprentissage, le, le partial, partial work, and everything like that. Because if you do that, people uh, start knowing what are companies. The, when, when you go through the, the system, the French system and the teachers don't speak much about what is the role of companies in the economy. It's not natural to speak about uh, a lot of things, but not practically. So we should must be much more practical to explain to people what brings company. And company is, not, uh, company is not a beautiful place to be, but company is not hell. And you have, most people have to go to company to make their money. And, and, and I think the company are presently moving to be less, uh, with less hierarchy, with more flexible ways. People love now to go in small companies, not big companies. So I think the system is also evolving there, more creative. And for that, the service system is much better. Yeah? I don't know if I answer your questions, yeah? So state intervention should continue, but, uh, uh, but uh, we, uh, this part are part of important reforms in France. We have to reform our education still, we have to reform our health system. Yes, although the health system, when you travel and you go to the United States and you go to the United Kingdom, you say, bless the French system. Okay, we gather more questions. So we have Yuri, Moya, Chatien, and Ludwig. Yeah. Well, yes. um, should question about the power of shareholders. The power of shareholders. Shareholders, yes. yes. Um, how to lower their power in corporations? You have that we should, that French corporations should adopt the German model with uh, the half of the board, with representatives of it's, employees. It's a bit too much, but we should, uh, we should uh, I mean, have, have, have strongly influenced the government in making some laws. Law one, one is very criticized by the most liberal in the French shareholding system. It's called la loi Florange. Uh, for example, we put double votes. Double votes are automatic unless wiped out by a majority of two-thirds. Before it was the reverse. Uh, I strongly advocated the employees on the boards. Not as much as in Germany, but presently we have two. And that is adopted and put forward. Basically, I want we support long-term shareholders and uh, we, uh, we, 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 we prevent companies from activist shareholders. So you mentioned the trend of rising up of startup companies in China. And you mentioned the fact that the competition faced by foreign companies in China, uh, from companies um, in China and also in the world market. So do you feel like this competition power is from the startup companies? Um, all the innovation power or more from this, the state big, big The biggest problem is with the, the, in many businesses, the big problem is with the state companies. But I, I basically think that uh, the Chinese government likes foreign companies to get their technology. Once they have taken their technology, they don't like them too much. This is typical. For example, uh, they, have, uh, they have made GVs for, for example, making a high-speed train with Bombardier and Siemens. And after they set their own companies, and so uh, the others left the business. So I really think, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, for example, Brazil <coughs> has decided to grow the country with the help of foreign companies. 
I'm not sure that the Chinese have made such a choice. I'm not sure the Koreans have made such a choice. Thank you. I, you made very interesting remarks about Confucius' value and the common values in Chinese companies. Uh, actually, as Chinese every day, we, we, we can feel the mismatch and confliction between those two kind of stuff. And we, we have very westernized infrastructure in terms of the corporation gov uh, corporate governance, but we also have some Asian values every day. But my question is that do you think such kind of Asian values embedded in the uh, in Chinese companies can really be exported? Because common values can really be easily exported, uh, affiliated to the Western governance structure. But when you talk about Chinese multinational companies. I, I think that uh, companies which are the most similar in terms of their values compared uh, to um, uh, compared to China are, are, are companies where you have really a, a very strong association between the ownership and the employees. I would state like that Swiss, maybe Nordic, and certainly Germany. So those values. I'm not saying that uh, Germany are using Confucius values, but I think that uh, the organization within these companies are more similar to Asian values, and uh, certainly quite different from the values where people say, well, it's normal, you have a, you have a shareholder, they, they keep the shares for about 18 months, they compare their performance to a kind of markup, and they have no affixio societatis, we say, no relation really now between the shareholders and the company. I think this is very bad. I think companies to be successful must have long-term policies, stable management, and employee participation, and employee dialogue. Social dialogue, long-term ownership, technological taking risk for long-term objective. Those are the successful companies in my view. And they belong to many countries. You have also there have that in the United States in some companies. I'm not saying, for example, that uh, GE is so different from those values. We continue. Um, Ludwig? I have a question. Uh, yeah, basi basically, you just asked the question. <laughs> okay, then. Ask, so that gets you. We pass to uh, Barbara. Uh, my question is about the innovation in France. Uh, I understand that France is a very innovative, innovative country, but when you look at the financial financing system of R and D in the United States, you, you understand that uh, France is still very far behind. I wanted to to ask you uh, when you look, when you look at the numbers, for instance, business angels, crowdfunding, capital, uh, venture capital, so. What do you think it would be the best way to try to... The, the, the best way has been a typical French answer. We have set a special bank, a BPE, for doing this kind of job. We have not found it in the private sector, so we took the typical French attitude, if the private sector doesn't work, let's do a state system, which is not perfect, but it's better than doing nothing. Income tax credit for, for R&D, it's okay, but uh, I, think, uh, I think it gave money for banks and things which are not doing real research. It has been overextended because of lobbying of no interest. It's, li it's like the, uh, you know, the credit for, for competitive credit. They gave it to the, uh, the low-cost uh, service company. So we received the money. The people wiping the street and everything, they should have gone it to industry. Mr. Montebourg proposed it, but the Minister of Finance killed it. <coughs> and partially the European Commission. The, European Co the European Commission is looking at, for example, state aid, even for R&D, very closely, uh, in my association. Uh, who knows that the Japanese are giving 4 billion euros each year to their companies, and they give to them the property 
of, uh, of the intellectual property. Just four billion. And, 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 and our, our stupid European Commission is looking at uh, 100 million and saying, oh, competition is going. It's stupid. They should look at what is doing uh, the other companies and look at the DAPA money. I mean, we are killing ourselves through our stupid uh, antitrust uh, competition organization in Brussels. It is the worst, the biggest, the biggest enemy of European industry is the European Commission for Competition. We can make another round. Um, uh, Benjamin. Shall we close your team? Um, she has to recognize, you know, she's the boss <laughs> today. <laughs> okay, yeah, Nolan. Green. Nolan uh, <coughs> Nabrouk, uh, I would, I would uh, ask a question and we'll close. Ah. Okay. 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 okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Nole and I'm um, from Zimbabwe and with uh, the fair exposure in terms of other African countries. My question is to do with, uh, you made um, sort of like a recommendation that the Chinese business model somehow it's, it's, it's better than say the one in India which is democracy best. But uh, for well, like I'm, I'm not saying that. Uh, the word better is a, a bit. Uh, it has an economic advantage. And basically, it raised the standard, because you said in the, the question that the aim is to raise the standard of living of people. When you look at numbers, it is clear that in the recent years, the Chinese system has raised the standard of the peasants much more than the Indian system. Yeah, uh, if I can go a little bit further, what I wanted to uh, further ask is that, uh, rather comment on is that, uh, there's a saying in Africa where we say that when the Europeans, in terms of investors, they come to Africa, they ask for human rights, like uh, good governance before they invest. But with the Chinese, they always ask for mineral rights. And they, don't, they don't care about the political system in the target country. This or is they care my, about my South Westphalia, Westphalia peace uh, principle. Principle, yes. <coughs> so, yeah, so that's, so uh, it was my point I was building it on that, that are you relating, would you relate the Chinese model then to West Philia Treaty? Uh, I, you, you have understood that I think that uh, the French, uh, I mean the, the, uh, the Western world should less try to put their own even values in the planet. They should just trade in a more economic way, final. But that is my way. My, my, that is my feeling. Uh, I, I had a big discussion with uh, uh, Tony Blair about that. He was absolutely against my view. <laughs> oh yeah, Tony Blair is a full believer of uh, Catholic values uh, as the best along the planet. So, um, just a very quick question and more on the introspective side. What are your opinions about inequality, the rising inequalities, which has been empirically uh, proved now, poverty, um, social, social missions of governments, welfare states, because I see that you come from a business-centric approach, and I understand there are billions on the table, but what about the billions who are in poverty? And I come from India, and I can totally say yes, it's well, heartbreaking. The only thing I can answer is to look at what is called, uh, if you are an economist, the Gini Index. What has been the Gini index? The Gini index is a, is a way to measure inequality in a country. Uh, I live in a country, France, where the Gini index has rather gone in the right direction, reducing inequality. The country where the Gini index has gone the worst, basically is not China, although China is not that good, but it is the United States. The country where inequality has been recently the most, most uh, growing, the inequality, has been the United States, which is, which, which is for me a bit of a surprise, because the United States is a dynamic economy presently and everything, but basically inequality is growing, and politically the country which supports the most the inequality has had a bigger success in the recent elections. So, Let's say that the United States love a lot of inequality. Maybe wrong. 
But that's, that's what I think. I think there will be a balance, personally. I think the balance in the state's inequality is going a bit too far. On the rest, in France, uh, we have been reducing inequality. If you don't know, uh, the rich people in France have had a recent taxation uh, increase, which I can talk about uh, to you, which has been significant. <laughs> but we are not good. Well, I personally will not leave France because it's too fun to live here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really for being less taxed. Would you live in Brussels? Would you live in uh, Geneva? No. Let's stay in Paris. You pay your tax and you stay in Paris. Okay, we have. Yes. Uh, how can we force um, insurance companies to be a long term shareholder or to a, finance? A, a, uh, you can make systems, financial systems. The opposition is uh, that they won't take the risk, is also the regulation they have had, solvency too. The, the, the overall regulation, the regulators have not made any of their regulation of the financial systems based on the question of economic growth. Basically, they have been extremely uh, putting their regulation on a pure financial no-risk way. And of course, if you put all your money in bonds, then you'd have no risk. Uh, you have to, uh, to know that uh, the insurance company have nearly sold all their shares in companies just to get into bonds because of solvency too. So there has been a very big lack of coordination between the financial regulations recently set up to prevent the financial crisis and what is needed for the growth of the economy at large, which is a bit surprising. Um, okay, go first. We have three more questions and we close. I have only one question, for example, when you go to such countries where the corruption is a big issue, for example, Russia, how do you deal with corruption, for example? I don't go to Russia. <laughs> 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 and I'm very pleased to have seen corruption being really attacked by uh, the new chairman of China, which is really attacking corruption. But in Russia, I do business in Russia, but very far from Moscow, in small towns and everything. But basically, I, I frankly have decided because of this risk or which are not part of the values we have in our company. And uh, we don't say that because it's, let's say, Russia, then we'll adapt to Russia. No, we'll keep the standards of Saint-Gobain. And basically, we don't go to Russia. Okay. Uh, my question is, you talked about the fact that the <coughs> advantage that India has is that they just put everything on the cloud and it's easier. So it brings to the question of logistics. So if, you're pro if you said that we should promote industries, we should tackle the issue of logistics, which is in some kind of obsolescence. But my real question is, I come from Nicaragua. Uh, Nicaragua. I don't know if you've heard, but because it's, it's a surprise for me that in Europe it's not a common issue, that they're wa they want to build a canal. Because they found that the Panama Canal is obsolescent. They cannot even... Uh, yeah, they have made a project. Exactly. So my question is, what do, what do you think about First, the obsolescence of the of, of logistics in the world, if you want yeah. to raise... Uh, By logistics, maybe you say what I would call in France infrastructure. No, the, the question of infrastructure is, is major, is major of that. But I, th I, I must add one point for, for business. When I look at uh, the competition we can have in businesses of Saint-Gobain through internet, the biggest competitors could be companies like Amazon because of logistics. So I think logistics is one of the major points to be made presently in companies and pay much more attention than before. And for countries, infrastructure is very important. But sometimes big infrastructure is not the solution. In energy, for example, uh, the big dams, big things, big roads, where the solution? Today, I think you can find a kind of, uh, I'm very interested by, in emerging countries, especially kind of low cost, intelligent, adapted to the country solutions. And you can find some. But the, the question was, 
because you also related to geopolitics and all, and all, the canal is going to be financed by China. Yeah. Yeah. So what you said about China just eating a little bit of yeah. the world yeah, and it's course. based on course. So of course. why haven't Europe, if they had a, some point... Because Europe is poor, because it is not united. Europe, Europe, uh, Europe is a big country if it is united. If it is not united, it is a, a sum of dwarfs. Okay, maybe two last questions from my part. Uh, one is more the, the geopolitical part of your speech was now the battleground is on the economy and the war is not over but sometimes localized and has changed in a way. Do you think that the case of Ukraine yeah, now, involving Russia, etc., is... Ukraine uh, is not a big, big... No, it's not a big, but it's involving Russia, it's involving... I mean, it's <coughs> at the geopolitical level, it's, it's in Europe. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't so you? Let's look at it. You, you're not afraid. Right. Ukraine, this part has been historically part of Ukraine from from 200 years and even more. So if you can take it somewhat back, I'm not shocked. <laughs> because it is a, a, a historical country. It's like Crimea. They have owned that for years. Don't forget that Ukraine was created abnormally as p p uh, out of Russia. But it's true that the Western part has always been European, but the Eastern part has always been Russian, historically. So, and my, my, my last question is, is maybe a little bit provocative, but I, I don't know what's your opinion on, on Piketty's work and Piketty's proposal. And, and, and you probably noticed, but it's also anecdotal, that one of the of, of the CEO of a company in the United States, after reading the book, said, okay, I really want to incre I, I increase the wages by 20% or 25% yes. in my film. Anyway. Well, I think the book first has been criticized in some aspects, and I'm not a technician to have a view on that. Uh, but basically, if, if the view is that there are countries with too much inequality, uh, it's clear that the trend of recent moves, especially in the biggest country of the planet, the United States, has been a bit staggering for me. I'm not saying that we come back to the 99% uh, tax of Mr. Roosevelt. Don't forget Roosevelt taxed 99% uh, uh, at the time. But, but I don't think that, on the other end, uh, Piketty's ideas are so valid for France. Yes, but, but tax, ta tax on the labor is part of the, of the wage. Okay, so if we reduce tax on the, on the wage, in a way we reduce the salary because it pays the, the retirements. Et yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. So how, how do you... No, I, I, basically, I basically think that the way we use the labor as a tax basis compared to other things uh, 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 is not the best. Uh, in the older days, we taxed the windows. Maybe that's good to come back to windows. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.